Hey everybody, I'm Jeremy Kahn from Bloomberg News, and I'm really honored to be here with Luke uh, from Samson's Innovation Center. Um, as you heard, Luke's a real pioneer in the field. Um, you know, he led the development team of Siri at Apple um, and at Samson, uh, helped pioneer their Arctic Cloud uh, offering, and is now working on all kinds of fantastic stuff, which I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit about. Um, the topic of this you know, talk is, is, is about AI and, and sort of the, the promises and pitfalls of AI at the moment. So I want to really start by saying, asking Luke, what, what's real here? I mean, you hear, there's a lot of hype about artificial general intelligence, that we're just on the cusp of having machines that are going to you know, be able to think like us and do all these things that we can do. Um, I think you're a little bit more skeptical about that. But what, where, do you see, where do you see the real promise of AI um, in the near term? So before talking about the near term, maybe I want to talk about uh, the past. Okay. So the reality is that you know, AI exists for the past 60 years, basically, right? It started in the 50s, and uh, the term AI uh, was coined in, uh, in 1956. So, you know, more than 60 years ago. And, um, and the reality is that since then, we didn't make much progress. I mean, the bottom line is that um, we are talking a lot about it right now, but at the time, we were also talking a lot about it. You know, and because it didn't achieve what it was supposed to achieve at the time, uh, it actually went to something that is called the AI winter. And, um, and so we had several AI winters actually since then, because every time, you know, we, we got excited about uh, AI, we basically, you know, didn't deliver. So uh, I don't want to be too much excited. I don't want to be too much, you know, as a pessimist, but, but we need to be very, very careful not to promise things that are not going to happen. So now to talk a little bit about the future and not to be pessimistic, you know, um, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of good things that can be done in the next few years in AI. And I'm going to rephrase actually that by saying there are a lot of things that can be done in machine learning and deep learning. Because AI, I think, you know, is too wide. We don't know exactly what that means. And, um, and when, you, we, when we look at the past seven years, eight years, it's really you know, around machine learning and, and deep learning that a lot of uh, interesting things happened, but it's, very, it's just very the beginning. You right. know? I know when we spoke before the panel, you mentioned that, uh, and a lot of the progress in machine learning has been in, around computer vision, and you're very excited about what computer vision can do uh, as we apply it to different use cases. Maybe you can talk about some of the things you've looked at. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, the vision uh, is something that was pretty easy, right? So, I mean, <laughs> it was basically a two-dimensional thing, you know, and you, you look around and you try to find you know, some shapes and, and forms and, and stuff. So, it's a very interesting thing because uh, with the explosion of data, you have now the ability, you know, to have a much better um, decision-making that a, a, a human would, uh, would do, right? You know, so... So one thing that I really am really excited about, you know, for the next um, few years is vision around health. So obviously, you know, being able to look at, uh, you know, thousands and thousands and millions of uh, imagery uh, of uh, breast cancer, for instance, you know, and being able to detect that very, very early because, you know, with the, the, the many, many images that are out there, it's much easier to do than what a specialist, you know, that has exposure only to a few hundred cases, you know. Uh, I, I think that right there, there is something very, very exciting. Right. And, and I, I know we, when we talked earlier, you said that you're, you're not as optimistic about what's going to happen with sort of language processing. This is a harder problem, you think, than vision. And although we're making some progress uh, in natural language processing, you, you don't think we're, we're quite there yet, maybe, and where we, where we need to be. Yeah, and it's weird that when it's me saying that, right? But, <laughs> but yeah. that's true that uh, really in 1956, when, uh, when AI started, it started around uh, NL, natural language, understanding, and, and speech. And, and it failed. That's why, you know, it went to this winter that I was talking about. And the reality is that natural language, you know, is multidimensional. I was talking about the images, you know, that are basically two dimensions, you know, or three with the colors or something. But, but speech and natural language is much more complicated, you know. Just me, for instance, right now talking, you know, with my French accent, I'm much more difficult to understand, you know, than you, for instance, you know, in your native language. So that, that's, 
that's an issue that is not solved yet. And the last mile, basically, you know, the, the last three, four percent that we need in order to recognize completely the meaning of sentence, the meaning of what, you know, is being said is far to be solved. Right. So it's going to be very, very difficult. Yeah. You mentioned a little bit about the, the promise of, of AI in healthcare with computer vision to, to read medical imagery. I know you've also been looking at what can be done with the combination of data from wearables and uh, predictive analytics. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what you see happening in that space. So the reality is that, you know, when I looked at uh, what we call AI today, I mean, I don't think that we use enough, you know, what I'm calling the multimodal aspect, you know, of the signals that we can, uh, that we can get. Um, so when we look at the image, you know, we look at those two dimensions and try to recognize that. When we look at sound, we just look at sound. Maybe, you know, when we want to do a speech recognition, we should also look at the lips, also look at the, the gesture, look at the other senses, you know, that are around. And this is what is going to help the humans basically to, uh, to make the actual recognition. So I think that this field is not um, exploited enough yet. And we need, you know, to push more the multimodal signals and to have really interoperability between all those signals in order to achieve much better recognition in whatever uh, domain we are talking about. Is that, is that something you're working on at Samson? Are you looking at ways to increase that, uh, pull, pulling that signal out, out from the noise? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we, you know, redefined a little bit what is called IoT, right? IoT is part of AI somehow because the objects, you know, become intelligent. So what we did basically, instead of calling IoT Internet of Things, you know, we started to call it interoperability of things when things start to, to work with each other. And then we are redefining that now as intelligence of things where really things are going to deliver something, you know, that is going to be for you as a great service and that is going to be, you know, making the objects intelligent. Absolutely. Um, when, when people talk about IoT, you talk about all sorts of connected devices, uh, but one of the, one of the big topics uh, is always, you know, connected cars. And are we going to see self-driving? What are our cars going to know about us? What are they going to be able to do on their own? Uh, I know you've looked a little bit about, uh, at this at Samson, but um, I, what do you feel about self-driving cars? Is that, is that, are, they gonna, are they in the next five years, or are we further away than that? I would say about 500 years. So, I mean, the reality <laughs> is that, you know, the, the, this, is very, very, this is a very complex problem. I was talking about speech. You know, speech is multiple dimension, but, I mean, the, the cognitive load in a car is even, you know, multiplied by, you know, a few dozen, you know. Right. So, so that, that's a very, very complex problem, you know, to be able to anticipate every single event that are, event that are going to happen, you know, in the, while driving. So... We have a lot of help in the car today, and the, the, the progress and what we are going to see in the next few years is going to be very interesting in terms of safety. So for sure, you know, the cars are going to be much safer, and I'm very excited to be able to give, you know, an, automate, an autonomous car right. to my kids because I trust the car much more, more than my kids, right? I mean, I, I love them, but I mean, you know, yeah. they will be teens, right? And they are going to, to drive, and they are not going to be safe, for right. sure, because of the pressure and whatever. So, so I'm excited about the safety functions of the car. For sure, you know, the cameras, the sensors, everything that is there is going to help a lot to avoid a lot of accidents and a lot of deaths. You know? So that's great for that. A full autonomous car, anytime soon, I don't think that is going right. to happen. Interesting. Um, Obviously, you helped pioneer Siri. You know a lot about sort of digital assistance. Um, and we've made great progress in having things that can kind of understand us and talk back to us. And yet, I think some people are very frustrated with their experience with these digital assistants. They aren't yet sort of smart enough. Um, and and how, do, how, what, how do you sort of view where we are in the evolution of sort of smart assistants and digital assistants? So again, I mean, it's, there is the speech part and the, the natural language part. The natural language part is very complex. You know, to be able to understand the domain fully, you know, it's complicated. Us, with our brain, you know, we, we are kind of, you know, average at everything, right? So we are, we are pretty good or average at everything, and we can understand a lot of different domains. In order for the machine, you know, to recognize everything and to be able to be smart in every single domain that we are anticipating it to work, I mean, it's complicated. I mean... At the end of the day, all those machines, you know, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about artificial intelligence, because all the machines at the end of the day, they are not intelligent. I mean, they, 
there is nothing that they, they do by themselves. We teach them everything. And if you don't go to every single domain, you know, and, and tell them what to do, they won't be able to, to do it, right? So the reality is, you know, the, the, the Amazon Echo or, or Google Home or all those, those systems you know, that are there, they are very good in very specific areas. But for sure, they do not link, you know, all my world and they won't be able to, to, uh, to achieve the results that I'm um, waiting from my personal assistant, right. my human personal assistant. We have a related question from the audience. Um, someone asked, you know, if you can give us your view on, on personal assistance in the automotive world. Um, do, you, do you see a greater role for these, uh, these assistants in cars? I mean, the good news about, you know, an assistant in a car is that most likely we are not going to ask it about uh, cooking, right? So the domain is going to be restrained. I mean, as long as you restrict domain to something, you know, that is going to be a normal behavior in this environment, we are going to achieve pretty good results. So an assistant in the context of a car, you know, asking for a, a, a way, you know, to, to go somewhere or asking, you know, for music or something. I mean, even music might be complicated, but, but right. anyway, so asking for something that is going to be in this uh, very uh, defined environment is going to be okay. I mean, it's like I was talking about the, the, the home assistants today, you know, the Google Home and, uh, and Echo. Uh, I mean, they are pretty good at managing my lights and my doors and my, because, you know, they are in this environment that are, that are simple, right? But of course, I'm not going to, it's starting to be much, much more difficult when I'm asking to manage my calendar, for instance. Right, absolutely. Um, I know a lot of people in the audience uh, may work for startups and yeah, it's Samson. You guys are always, you know, looking for people to partner with. But I think you're you're a big organization, and I think approaching a company like Samson, if you're a small company, can be kind of intimidating in a lot of ways. Um, there might be a lot of concern about, oh, am I going to get, you know, squashed by this big behemoth? Are they going to take my idea and, and just run away with it? Um, Maybe you can offer us a little bit of insight on, on you know, how you at Samson try to work with innovative smaller companies. Yeah, so we set up the, the innovation center you know, in, the, in the Silicon Valley uh, six years ago in order to explain that we want to be part of the ecosystem. We understand that even you know, us being big, I mean, we cannot do everything by ourselves. We need you know, to be helped and we need you know, to help as well the community. So we are very, very clear about that. I mean, we, 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 I mean, we try not to be too arrogant, you know, I mean, we could be, but we, we try not to be. Uh, and we really want to find the gems, you know, and to help them to grow in their own environment. And then, you know, of course, at one point, we want to benefit from that if we find something interesting. But we want also them, you know, to, to grow by themselves, you know, to deliver some technologies that we couldn't have done by ourselves. Right. Interesting. And, um, and you have examples of companies you've sort of, you have partnered with a number of smaller companies, right, on some of these, uh, some of these solutions. Sorry, I didn't You've partnered with some of these smaller companies on, on some of these solutions that you've been, been working on. We, yeah, you, I'm saying, have you done that? I mean, you have some track record of uh, partnering. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So, so yes. yeah, yeah. We, we did actually in the past uh, six years, we did invest, you know, we have a fund, so we did invest in, uh, right. in a few dozen co companies both you know in the states i mean everywhere in the world actually states europe israel so uh, so we did uh, we are doing that actively today and we have uh, uh, you know so, some people from the catalyst fund it's called the catalyst fund here that are definitely you know uh, scouting and, yeah. and looking around you know if there is something interesting right uh, i know you spent a lot of time thinking about iot and connected devices and how this can kind of be married to to our predictive analytics from machine learning um, one of the big concerns there, though, has been security. As we build out more and more devices, uh, which have the ability to network and communicate, that you know these devices need to be secured. Are you concerned about what, what's happened so far in that? And, and are you working on anything uh, to try to solve the security issue? Yeah, of course. I mean, when you build a platform that is going to be an IoT platform, I mean, you need to define first, you know, what is security and privacy, and specifically privacy. Because at the end of the day, I mean, we, you want to be able to, to tell the people, you know, that have those objects that are in charge of those objects. Of course, it's going to, uh, to imply that um, people need to be educated. A lot of the issues that we have today, you know, in terms of security and privacy is that people don't realize that once the data, you know, is out there, it's out there, right? So they need to understand what makes sense to send where. And so what we have been doing, you know, with the platform that we built in the past five years now, 
uh, we have been giving the keys to the people. So to be sure that they are in full control of all the data coming out, the objects that they control. And they are going to be the ones you know, saying, OK, I want to use this service, but not this service. Because I don't believe that this service is going to, be to, to, to uh, uh, have a good use of my data. And that, that very choice, I mean, means education, right? I mean, you might not know. So we want to be you know, as open as possible, as clear as possible, in order for people you know, to realize what are the dangers. In terms of pure security, of course, you know, the system that we are designing, we want them secure as much as we can. The reality is that I'm not going to stand here, you know, in front of everybody saying that we have a secure system. That's, that would be a lie. There is no secure system. Right. We have a as secure as possible right. system, right? So we need to be very, very clear about that. And everybody that is saying and that is claiming that they have a secure, a fully secure system, they are lying. Right. Interesting. Um, a few uh, panels ago, uh, there was a robot up here um, talking to people. Um, sometimes when people think about artificial intelligence, there's this debate about sort of are we making more progress uh, in AI software than we are in robotics? Uh, how important is embodied intelligence to reaching higher levels of, of uh, and generality? I, I'm curious what you think about robots. I mean, do you, what do you think about the potential of robots and kind of taking a lot of our you know digital system technologies, such as you've worked on in the past, and, and integrating that into embodied robots? Yeah. So f from what I said, you know, earlier, I mean, I, I like robots in general. I like robots. You know, what you know the the, the previous person was saying there. They are going to take a lot of tasks that we won't want to do, right? And this is what they have been doing in the past, you know, 50 years already. And I think that for that, it's very, very good. We need to be careful not to say, you know, something again that is not true about robots. The robots are not going to kill us if we don't tell them to kill us. Right. Okay? So we are in control. We are in charge. Right. You know, there is nothing that is going to be, you know, this general, this artificial general intelligence that we are talking about, or, you know, the, the, um, the killer robots that are going to take over the planet. I mean, this is Hollywood, okay? In Hollywood, it's very nice, yeah. but it's not the reality. Right. And it's not anytime soon with the current way we are doing artificial intelligence. Right. Artificial intelligence today, machine learning, deep learning, and the, the, the expert system that we used to have, this is all about mathematics, you know, and rules and things that we control. There is nothing in the current way we are doing AI uh, that is like our brain. And I want to give an example you know, about that that I find very, very interesting and that we need to think about. This is the, the example of, um, of the DeepMind AlphaGo machine, you know, against the, the, the world champion. So, yes, AlphaGo won. Very nice, you know, it was the same thing a few years before, a few decades before, you know, with the, with the chess. But look at what AlphaGo is. AlphaGo is, you know, a few hundred GPUs and CPUs, a lot of memory. It's basically a data center. A data center that is taking 440 kilowatts an hour, okay? And look at the guy that is in front of this uh, AlphaGo machine. The guy is a world champion, a teenager, you know, that, is, that has a brain that is taking 20 watts an hour. And by the way, this guy doesn't do only go. He does a lot, a lot of other right. things. So what I'm saying with that is that the techniques that we are using today in AI, they have nothing to do with what our brain is doing. So it was the promise 60 years ago. This is what we are hoping, but we are not there yet. And it's maybe, you know, by adding a lot of different techniques, mixing the techniques, maybe, you know, adding biology to mathematics and adding quantum computer. I don't know what it is, but it's going to be something else than what we are doing today. Interesting. You mentioned the, the, the difference in energy consumption of the human brain versus uh, AlphaGo. Is, is power consumption and compute capacity, is that a limiting factor for AI and where you think you can go? Yeah, of course, because, I mean, uh, you know, 440 uh, kilowatts just to play Go. I mean, if you want to have something that is going to be much, much more generic, I mean, you can imagine that you are going to have to need several nuclear plants. I mean, this is not scalable. So we need to rethink that, you know, and we need to go, I think, from the big data that is being crunched, you know, through, uh, by those machines to something that I call small data that is going to be much closer to what we are doing with our brains. Great. You heard your first small data, not big data, is the future. Thank you very much. We're out of time. Thank you very much, Luke, for joining me. Appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Thank you.